Hi, everyone, and happy Monday. Welcome to this episode of Conversations with Julia Craven. I'm Julia, and today I am chatting with Mickey Kendall, writer and author of Hood Feminism and Amazon's abolitionist and activist for a discussion about hood feminism, why it's important to center marginalized women, and why police violence is a feminist issue, and so much more. We're, we're going to get all into it. And make sure you circle back next week um, because I will be talking with someone else who is making strides in their respective field. But hi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So yeah, let's um, let's just hop right into it. Um, so let's talk about hood feminism um, because I think that is presenting feminism in a way that is not um, that is not typically presented to folks. So what is hood feminism? So hood feminism is the lived feminism that you do day to day. It's the work, right? Whether it is making sure people in your community are eating, making sure they have childcare, making sure um, that the issues like police violence and other forms of violence are being addressed. It is what happens when survival of everyone is your priority, as opposed to whether or not you're gonna to get to be a CEO. Wow. And so let's actually, let's just go into the police violence part of this because there was a shooting in Chicago that has resulted in a night of unrest and there's also a very pervasive idea that police violence is not a feminist issue. And so I just want to leave the floor open for you to talk about that. So two things. A, if you think police violence is not a feminist issue, what you're really saying is that the women who are more likely to be targets of police violence don't count, right? We don't have say her name about one woman or one race of women. We have say her name about a lot of women, largely black women, but let's be clear here, there are lots of people who are other women of color who fall under that same umbrella because no one's talking about them, whether we're talking about indigenous women who have been killed by police, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about trans, cis women that, you know, non-binary, genderqueer, you know, this is an umbrella where we're saying all of these people who we know are at a greater risk of facing violence from policing we are saying that they don't count in these feminist issues. And that is appalling, honestly. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Then when we're talking specifically about Chicago and the narrative of looting, I'm still mm -hmm. not sure why I'm supposed to care more about windows than people being dead, than people being harmed, than the black site, right? Chicago is the only city in America with a police torture center because we had so many people being tortured by police that as part of a consent decree, we now have to talk about our history of, of, of police using torture to mm. frame people for crimes they didn't commit. So when people say, well, the cops said, I need people to stop yeah. listening uncritically to police officers in general, because I don't know how many times we have to prove that they lie. And specifically, it's a thing called test lying, where a federal judge has recognized that police testimony, and this term originates in Chicago too, is not actually a reliable situation. So when we mm -hmm. say it's not a feminist issue, when we say that, you know, well, what about these windows and all of these things? You're telling the mother whose child has just been injured, you don't count. You're telling the women who may, because the second most common form of police brutality is sexual violence, who may have been assaulted mm -hmm. by an officer. We have plenty of records of that around the country as well, that they mm -hmm. don't count. And so, you know, and then when we say, well, let's elect some women and those women will fix it. Mm -hmm. Mayor Lori Lightfoot's concern has been blocking off downtown. She's black lesbian. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you that I was a fan of her opponent either. I think that we got a situation where representational politics meant we were picking between two bad options. And there was an argument mm -hmm. to be made that the other option, uh, Tony Preckwinkle might be better. I don't believe it. You know, then we have uh, Kim Fox, who's the current state's attorney, and just electing people who look like you is not enough. You need to be asking questions about their politics and their beliefs, but you also need to be looking at the systems they're coming into because Lightfoot's appeal to people was about her 
tough on crime ness because America loves the rate, the words tough on crime. We don't actually care about solving crimes. Chicago police yeah. have solved less than 25% of murders in the city. So, you know, but also when we're looking at it, this is a system and I'm not letting light foot off the hook, but this is a system that mm -hmm. over decades has been built. I don't expect any individual politician, right, to uncreate a hundred years. And we are now in a situation around the country in multiple places where we're finally admitting that maybe we have a real problem and that maybe black lives mm -hmm. do matter. I don't think Lightfoot was great, but I don't know that I had a politician who was showing up in Chicago who was great to pick as a, a person to vote for because Chicago mm -hmm. politics and everyone's politics, frankly, kind of weed out anyone who might be good at the job in a way that recognizes humanity and decency of others, right? We're not even, mm -hmm. I know people will say, well, this is, you know, this was progress because we elected this lesbian. This is progress because we elected this black woman as state attorney. And it is kind of progress, kind yeah. of, but it's like, the millimeter step forward and not necessarily that much of a step forward and might be a couple steps back and two to the side and because fundamentally we're too flawed to right. do better. Right. I'm sorry. That no, was and I, <laughs> no, it's fine. I love it when guests do that. Um, and I think you, you made a really good point um, of how just because you're a black woman, just because you're queer, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to enter a system and completely uproot it and give it an overhaul. Um, and white supremacy can absolutely be facilitated by black people and other people of color. Um, and so now, I think it's a good time to talk about the importance of a feminist lens in policy because it feels like that's kind of where we've landed. So here's the thing, when we're talking about a feminist lens, when we're talking about power and getting power to do things, we already know that white mainstream middle-class feminism had no problem using that power to silence the voices and the concerns of women of color. Unfortunately, when we bring in, you know, class, like how much money you were, really earning and respectability mm -hmm. in this case, if your feminist lens says that only some people deserve to be protected, only some people deserve to be safe, only some communities deserve to be cared for and funded, then your feminism sucks, frankly. And also it, it goes right <laughs> back to you replicating the problems that we're supposed to be trying to combat, right? If you're going mm -hmm. to seek power, you have to think past, I got the power to what am I going to do with the power? Because unfortunately, and especially this is especially true when we get into representational feminism and the idea of the girl boss and that kind of thing, right? And it's groundbreaking, we elected a black woman. It's groundbreaking, we elected a black man. Cool, um, but what are they gonna do with that power? And how much power do they really have, right? right? How much power do they have? Because as we're seeing in police departments all around the country, Frankly, policing itself has been out of control for longer than any particular administration, right? We've seen police mm -hmm. unions grow to a place where officers basically have immunity from prosecution, regardless of the crimes that they may commit, on video, no less. And yeah. I think that when we're talking about this, about feminism and power and all of these things, we also need to be talking about the idea that the policy that you're going to write has to be policy that doesn't necessarily center you the person with the access to write policy. Poor people don't write policy. Right. People who have been on the, mar marginalized people don't generally get to write, you know, whether it's food stamp budgets or immigration policy or policing. We are seeing what happens when the people who are in power have never experienced or have forgotten their experience of being one of those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I definitely think that our budgets and um, our policies would look a lot different if marginalized folks did write them. Um, I did another interview last week with a with a friend of mine, and she said that the like a city or a state's budget is kind of their moral blueprint. That's where you see what they really care about. Um, and so I would love to get your take on that too, because when we talk about feminism and we're talking about policy, we're talking about how much money gets allocated um, to address food apartheid, to help with healthcare, to help with childcare. 
So I'm going to say this. I'm, I'm, I'm ramping on Chicago this entire time. I acknowledge it. <laughs> Chicago police solve less than 25% of crimes. This is not me mm-hmm. making that number up. That is their, their own data. They, um, frankly, so far, given how many cases turn up, people were being framed, that number of solve is real dubious. They cost mm-hmm. the city more money in lawsuits than any budgetary concern. Chicago has to self-insure at this point because we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on resolving police brutality lawsuits for the cops who, again, don't solve crimes and do things like shoot 15 year olds. Right? So that's mm-hmm. all playing out. That's our budget. But we defunded schools. We defunded mental health care clinics. And this isn't even just a light foot thing. This, again, has been going on for years. The neighborhoods where you were most likely to see reports of violence in Chicago are neighborhoods that had their transportation cut. They had their schools Mm -hmm. closed. They often lack grocery stores. They lack lack jobs, right? And -hmm. so then we say to people who are only being given bad choices, why aren't you making better choices? Well, there's not a good choice on the table. And that's not letting the individual person off the hook, but I, I wonder how many obstacles we get to stack up in a city And then say, well, those people don't try hard enough before we talk about the fact that you're starving their communities. Systemically Mm -hmm. and ongoing choices are being made across decades, right? The west side of Chicago often ends up on TV and so does the south side because people say, well, there's shooting and there's violence and there's gangs. Okay, so I'm a south side girl. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm gonna point out to you that in many cities, your bad neighborhood, if you go back, let's go 40 years. You're going to find out that your bad neighborhood used to be a thriving neighborhood, but largely one of color. And then Mm -hmm. um, services were cut. And then other services, right? Stores closed. They weren't replaced. Um, My neighborhood went seven years without a full service grocery store. Right. Mm -hmm. So the people who could afford to move end up moving out because they don't have services. The schools have lost $1.8 million. An individual school can lose $1.8 million in their budget in budget cuts across a couple of years. There's no mental health clinic. The bus services have been cut. The city is not coming to do things as mundane as pick up trash. If you call the police, they may or may not show up and they may or may not be of any use to you. They also may shoot you when you call them because Chicago has had that happen a couple of times. So then we say to the people who were left, the people who could not afford to leave and who have been living essentially in a community that is being systematically destroyed at every level, well, you should get a job. You should get to that job, I don't know, through osmosis, magic, teleportation. I haven't figured that part out yet. Not osmosis. Right. (laughs) Right? And- No, but yeah. while we're doing all of that, those demands on you, we want you to still tolerate the lack of resources. And oh yeah, by the way, the job that you can get because your zip code can impact your higher ability because we've again systemically starved your communities and all of that, you probably won't make a living wage. But then we tell you not to do crime to survive. And also don't ask the state for help. If my choices are sell drugs or starve, I'm going to pick sell drugs. If my choices are um, sell something else, whether it be sex work that we make illegal for reasons that still are unclear to me, or um, Mm -hmm. online hustling, whatever, whatever it is, or starve, no one's going to pick starvation. And I understand that people will say, well, they can get food stamps and they can this and they can that. Food stamps work out to $1.50 to $1.60 per meal. I don't know if people understand how little food you can get for $1.60 per meal, but when these are what you're looking at, right? And that's before we get into whether your housing is safe, whether there's lead in the water in your housing, all of these things, you are in a situation where you are going to do whatever you have to do to make it. We could end crime in America in any neighborhood by actually funding neighborhoods, right? You could plant less flowers in your upscale neighborhood and spend that money on making sure that there are streetlights in schools in your lower income neighborhoods. We're choosing not to do that. We're consistently choosing, and this is happening in cities all around the country and really all around the world, to prioritize a handful of people's comfort over, because they're wealthy and they're white mostly, but sometimes not white, 
someone's going to tell me that it's not always white people. I know they are. But, you know, let's be honest. We're going to prioritize them having pretty flowers and clean streets and cops that are respectful and nice to them and polite to them because the police know who they can brutalize and who they can't because we're communicating to officers. We only care about certain people. We're communicating to criminals, right? That if your targets, and this is the case with Chicago and our not a serial killer, serial killer, right? 51 women mm -hmm. missing and murdered, black women missing and murdered in the city. They're, they insisted there was no serial killer, there was no way. But they were all dying the same way and they were dying in a pattern because what really they said was, even if you are a serial killer, these people, we don't care what you do to them. So we're not gonna investigate. You can get away with murder here as long as you murder the right people. Mm -hmm. And so when we say then that, you know, we don't know why these things are happening, we do know. We've known for decades. We keep choosing to do that. Right. And so this is a good um, segue into survival and how that is one of the things that makes feminism different for Black women. So, so I would love for, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just let opening me, up the floor for you to go. These are all my soapboxes. You're just going to let me go? Okay, fine, fine. Yeah, I'm just going to let you go. So here's the thing about Black feminism, uh, hood feminism, womanism, like you you pick your terminology, and there's some differences. I'm not going to say there's no differences. I, I would argue, um, as the person who coins the term hood feminism, the hood feminism is explicitly welcoming of trans, gender queer, and non-binary people. I do not want people to say, well, what about to me? Because I'm going to hurt your feelings, okay? And so when we're talking about survival, one of the places where respectability often comes in is that we say to women, cis, trans, whatever, who are engaging in sex work, well, we want to shame them for engaging in this sex work, but they need to eat. There's a book um, about a sex worker in Chicago, and I can't think of the name of the author, but the name of the book is I Had to Earn My Living. And it's her mm -hmm. specifically talking about interviews with, with sex workers from the um, early 1900s in Chicago. And the thing mm -hmm. is, we're back to, you know, the choices we are giving people, right? And I'm gonna bring in at this point, as part of the, this, this conversation, the video that came out from Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion, WAP, because I'm not sure that I can say its actual name on here. Um, people were all, yeah, oh my I God, know. I can't believe they're saying this. I can't believe that we're gonna talk about these things. Oh my God. I, I don't know why we think that somehow Oh, it's fine. Okay, so the song is called Good Ass Pussy. And the song tells you directly and deliberately that if you want some of this, you gotta pay for it. And people are right. just pearl clutching over it. But what do you expect many folks to do, right? We don't want you to have a non-respectable job. We don't wanna pay you enough as a black woman in that job that is quote unquote respectable for you to live on. But we also right. don't want you to market your own sexuality in ways that you are comfortable with and to share your body that you own because the meat suit you ride around in, it belongs to you. Nobody else gets right. a vote in it, is my, is my yeah. logic. And then we say, I am offended. What are we teaching young women today? What are we teaching young women today when we tell them to accept that they won't be paid what they're worth for the work that right. they do? to accept neighborhoods that will do their best to destroy them, to accept that the brutality that may happen to them doesn't count as much because they're not male, right? I don't know why respectability is so focused on, on sex and whether or not girls are, are getting paid for sex when girls are being killed because of their gender and their race in this country. Right. My priorities, frankly, are survival. They're always gonna be survival. I actually don't really care what you do with your personal meat suit, as long as what you do mm -hmm. with it is consensual and you wanted to do it, okay? That's mm -hmm. not my business. I'm not riding around in there. You are. If we want people to survive and we don't want to, because we have the budget, let's just be clear. America has the money to require absolutely no one to be poor. And no one would be, you know, billionaires would have a billion dollars less, right? You're worth a hundred billion dollars, yeah and you might be worth 50 billion instead. Oh my God, the horror, if you had to actually pay taxes. Right. That's so true. So, <laughs> I mean, you can only have one yacht. You might have to settle for five instead of 10. Right. Your house might Surprise. not be as huge and ugly. 
It's like, I'm sorry, yeah. your house can't be a million square feet. It has to be 500,000. What are you going to, how will you ever live if you might have to see the people that you are, that are part of your family? Gasp. And so I feel like when we're having all these talks about this and we're not saying it. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, y'all. We are having a People slight need... technical difficulty. Oh, I'm back. Uh, Am I... Yep. Okay. Yeah, you're back. You froze up okay. for a second there, though. <laughs> yes. I was like, wait a minute. I'm not. I'm not frozen for me. Sorry, <laughs> internet. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no. it's fine. So I was gonna say, you know, when we're talking about survival, I'm more concerned. Is does your neighborhood have reasonably priced grocery stores? Right. It's not enough to put a Whole Foods in. You got to have a grocery store with food you can afford because we call it whole paycheck for a reason. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. So you can you have grocery stores. Is your water lead free, clean and free flowing? Are you next to any kind of toxic waste dump? Are your schools open, functional and well staffed and, you know, possibly currently in the pandemic technologically set up? Are you in an area right. where you don't have access to broadband internet, but now we want you to educate your children without internet in the middle of a pandemic. Like there's all of these questions right. to answer that are frankly to me far more important than whether or not you're being respectable in your job. I don't care what you're doing. I care right. that your community is able to survive. Yeah, this um this reminds me of something that Toni Morrison said, and she was talking about racism. And I, I do think that that also applies here which is that the primary function of it is distraction. And when we talk mm -hmm. about respectability politics and we talk about what someone could be doing, how they could be making better choices, how they could, could, shoulda, woulda, coulda, all of that, we are not focusing on the systemic conditions that have placed them where they are. Right. And it's like, if you don't want people to have to depend on sex work or selling drugs to survive, then you need to give them resources, you need to give them jobs. And maybe they wouldn't. And then maybe people still would choose to do sex work and that's okay. <laughs> it's well, totally fine. I, I mean, and this is the thing. Sex work wouldn't exist without the demand for sex workers, right? Yes. You can't sell people things that they don't want. And I yes. know I'm supposed to be very pressed about sex work and the possibility that, um, I don't know, Jesus, I don't know. The answer here, quite honestly, is that if we're so concerned about sex, work, then we should be concerned about the people who are purchasing their services and not about the people who are in a position where they need to sell them. Right? Yes. But we're not. We if, if it were about ending sex work and we really are horrified, we'd be horrified on both sides of this equation. We're not. We just don't like that some people get to choose for themselves. Right. right? And I know someone's gonna bring up trafficking and trafficking is wrong and bad. Any sex worker will tell you that. But most yep. of the time in these conversations, also, even when we're talking about trafficking, if we're talking about domestic trafficking, we don't want to provide resources to uh, young black women who have been trafficked. Instead, we like to send them to jail, especially if they try to defend right. themselves. So you still don't really care about ending sex work. You don't care about ending trafficking. You just really don't like it and are mad that you have to know it exists. Right. Because right. what you kind of are telling me you want is for people to go without. To satisfy right. your ego. Which is so weird because most of the people who are yelling about capitalism and like all of this stuff, it's just like, do you really think that you will ever be a billionaire? Well, the thing that's always <laughs> weird to me is that not only do they think that they're gonna they're temporarily embarrass millionaires, like Americans love this lie, but even if you were somehow going to have all of this money, the city that you imagine apparently where there are no uh, poor people to care about or be concerned with, how does that city run, right? Yes. How do you have a thriving community with no one to be a nurse, a teacher, a lawyer, a doctor, a, a garbage collector? Because for the record, sanitation engineers are why we're not all dead of a plague already, right? So your yes. custodians, all of these people, we're saying we want, like right now, we want people to bring us our groceries. We want to be able to go out and have our food, have our hair, our nails done, but we don't want to pay those people a living wage. And then we also mm -hmm. want to judge people who engage in vice to make a living. Well, you just told me that the respectable work, you're not going to pay someone enough to live off of, right? Because right. currently 
with the minimum wage, there is nowhere in America where you can afford an apartment if you're earning minimum wage. Not a single right. state. So, right. and so, what, oh, right. sorry, go ahead. No, that's, that's it. So, when we're talking about the concepts of capitalism versus socialism and whatever, and side note, um, shit, I think I froze again. Maybe you froze. No, okay. I'm not frozen. Okay. <laughs> uh, you froze for a second. It was very strange. Oh. Um, Technologies, technologies, forgive us. Um, but when we're talking about this and we say, well, I don't want this, I don't want that. Roads and libraries are socialism. You could have more of it. You could have a universal basic income. You could have a lot of things, right? Like I wanted the future from the Jetsons, except I wanted to know what was under the clouds before I signed in the dotted line. I was concerned about that as a kid. Yeah. But um, we seem to want, we, right? Like we seem to want the Hunger Games as our future. I don't know why. That looks yeah, like a terrible picture, but yeah, it's kind of that scary. seems to be what people love the idea of, as opposed to one where everyone has what they need. Mm -hmm. I, I would much rather live in the future where everyone has enough to eat, a place to live, and and magic does their hair. I'm just saying. <laughs> exactly, and so what um, or how does feminism uplift everyone? Because I think that's something that we've kind of got at, but just a direct response. Okay, so here's the thing. We know there's research that shows that in cultures and communities where women, and we can take this all the way back to ancient Egypt and Sparna, cultures and communities where women had equality, even if they had some sort of gender role differences, where women were able to own property, all of these things, feminism, because feminism is actually older than the term itself, right? Um, right? Meant that everyone could be comfortable. Children were educated, golden ages, you know, that were happening, communities were thriving when everyone had what they needed. So when we're talking right. about feminism and equity and equality for all, we're not talking about you don't get to have your gold toilet or whatever, though why you want one, I don't know. We're saying though, that your gold toilet shouldn't mean that 35 people starve. We're saying that mm -hmm. as a culture on the planet, as every culture on the planet, a thriving, robust welfare state that cares for those with the least does not disadvantage those with the most to, to the extent that we're now being told in America, right? Every time you see those articles where they talk about countries where everything, this is the best place to live, Iceland, Finland, whatever, you know, they don't really have so many billionaires. It's true. They have a lot mm -hmm. more people who are, you know, making enough money to live on and have everything they need and have health care. Um, and I don't think that that is something that we need to think of as being bad or negative. We could just have enough. You don't have to have 17 cars. I promise. Right. I know, like, greed is a drug. You can have... <laughs> one car, two cars even, I don't care, and and stop mm -hmm. there, and your neighbors could have what they need to. And so feminism's focus, I think, should be on making sure mm -hmm. that everyone has their needs met, and then you can get your wants met. It's like it's like dealing with a five-year-old, right? You got to eat your vegetables, and in this case, the vegetables are equality for everyone and access and equity to everyone for everyone in order to get your dessert. And dessert is, I don't know, the gold lame toilet or whatever it is. <laughs> No, I think that's a really nice way of putting it. Um, and so has the, well, actually, before I ask you that question, because that one's a bit of a, of a wrap up, let's put a bow on it question. So before I ask you that, um, one of your essays, The Hood Doesn't Hate Smart People. I want to talk about that because I, I felt that. Um, and it's, it's such a, um, it's a very ubiquitous lie that there is some sort of hatred for smart black kids, um, even though smart is relative, truly, because you can be smart in many different ways. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I'm just so, I've always been very fascinated and perplexed by that idea that there is something about folks who are still in the hood where they just like hate the black folks who are no longer staying in the hood. That, that's always been weird to me because it 
never been my experience or the experience of anyone I know. So. <laughs> well, one of the things I've noticed about that lie, and I, I hate it, I hate that lie so much, um, is yeah. that often it's told by people who have personalities that you don't enjoy regardless of where you're from, right? So it <laughs> yes. doesn't like you, sweetie. Yeah, it's like sure. you're <laughs> And, and I, I say this as someone who honestly and accurately refers to myself as an asshole, but I am not the kind of person who won't go back home, who won't go into neighborhoods that are different from mine. And I've noticed that if you treat people with respect, regardless of where you are, people tend to respond accordingly. Like the hood really is fine with you, regardless of your background. I don't care how many letters are behind your name unless you're not okay with it, right? If you right. come in and you want to judge and you want to look down your nose and you want to be, frankly, an awful person to the people who were there, then that has some consequences. And I understand people are going to say, well, when they're kids, they don't know better. And I don't know if anyone has ever met a child, but kids are often terrible people and we have to teach them oh, not yeah. to be terrible people. And in many stories that you hear about the hood not liking smart kids, if you roll that beautiful bean footage back just a little bit and you ask about what happened before, right? Before that part mm -hmm. of the story that the person who was like, well, they didn't like me because I was smart. You find out that they were rude. They were mean. They were nasty. They threw things, right? Kids tease and kids are teased. My nickname in school was books. I was the nerdiest of nerdy girls. I have a book tattoo, right? <laughs> I still talk to the girls that I went to school with. I still know my old classmates from we the eighth grade reunion because we're dorks. I still know them. And a lot of them, frankly, you know, we took a lot of different roads out of Kosminski, Charles Kosminski High School, uh, grammar school. Yeah. But we were never allowed by our teachers to think we were better than each other, by our parents either. We were all, first of all, not better than each other. We mm -hmm. were in the same school, basic back, same, basically same backgrounds. But what I experienced was a lot of support. What I still experience is a lot of support, right? When I go to Facebook after this, you know who's going to pass this link around? The black girls I went to grammar school with. Right. You know, and so, and it won't just be them. I will have conversations with the guys. I will have conversations with people who have been locked up and people who are in all levels financially, because like I said, lots of roads, but we didn't hold grudges about what happened in fourth grade. We didn't right. decide that the culture was determined by an argument in the lunchroom in sixth grade. And I think right. sometimes people when they decide that the hood hates smart people they're really deciding that they're ready to write off everyone that they knew when they were growing up for reasons that I don't completely understand, right? Where yeah. you came from must have loved you enough to give you a boost out. Where you came right. from must have supported you enough to give you this boost out, to put you where you are now. I don't know why anyone would want to disrespect that by acting as though the good parts didn't happen. It doesn't mean nothing bad ever happened. But again, children are monsters and we teach them to not be monsters. I'm a parent. I'm right. <laughs> I remember being a kid and I'm was equally terrible as people I thought were terrible. Um because oh. you're a kid. Right. I was gonna say it. Oh, even though I talk about, you know, they called me books and yeah, I got teased. But best believe. I was a sharp tongued little monster myself. And on more than one occasion. When it came time for things to be wrong and escalate in fights, sometimes it was my fault. I was, yeah, it was my fault. So I can't really and be like, oh my God, about these folks 20 years later, 30 years later. Right. And it also, to me, is just an unwillingness to see how people grow and how people change. And it's indicative of a, it's usually indicative of an unwillingness within that person who thinks that the hood hates smart people. It's just like, you haven't changed that much since you were getting cussed out by your classmates in middle school, huh? And it's like, maybe those asshole kids had a point. Um, Cause you- It's been 30 years, girl, let it go. <laughs> exactly. And so we've covered so much of what I had written down to ask you about, but 
the last thing I do want to talk about is the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so has the pandemic shaped, changed, or confirmed um, the points that you make in hood feminism? So for me, it has confirmed. I should preface this by saying I had the virus back in March. Um, oh, and sorry. I was in New York yeah. on tour. <laughs> I came through two airports to a neighborhood that yeah. was one of the hot spots. You know, it was one of those things. Um, and so for me, when people started to see the flaws, as we're seeing with the lack of financial support for people in industries that cannot function in a pandemic, as we're seeing people realize that food stamps are not enough money. All I can say is that the safety nets that I have been saying all along we needed to strengthen or rebuild, this is why, right? The pandemic should not be the point at which you first learn oh, hey, I could be a poor person too. Most of us are not temporarily embarrassed millionaires, never mind billionaires. We're not even six month heirs, right? We are people who are one Hello? to two paychecks away, right? And I've <laughs> seen people still saying, well, why didn't you have savings to get you through this? Well, even if you had savings, how long do six months of savings last when this started in March? Right, we're at the end of that six month of savings window. Even if you have a full year, what happens next year? This is right. why we need it and still need. Let me just say, I absolutely hope from this pandemic, we learn because there are countries who are not going through what America is going through. Right. We could listen to Vietnam, we could listen to New Zealand, we could listen to Taiwan, we could listen to Iceland, Finland, you pick a country. The places with a more robust welfare state, and what that really means is that we spend less money on guns and more money on making sure everyone can survive, um, mm. they're going to come out of this better off than we are. They're going to come out of this healthier, longer lasting, optimal outcomes. They had medical facilities that were available Right. So a lot of underlying conditions that are happening in the U.S. where preventative care is apparently still an arcane mystery um, mm -hmm. are not happening in other places. So I hope that what we take away from this is that instead of spending, you know, four hundred billion dollars on building a better bomb, we could spend three hundred billion on building a better society. Right. We could spend mm -hmm. three hundred and fifty billion. I promise. Side note. We don't need any more guns. We don't need any more bombs. We have enough now. We we have enough. Yes. We can stop anytime. And like by anytime, I mean, right? Like globally. the whole planet. We don't we don't need any more. We can stop. Just stop. Right. And spend that money right. on building a society that could survive. Right. Because this pandemic, as scary as it is for many people, this was not the worst case scenario for a pandemic. Again, it's not the apocalypse unless we make it one. And right now we seem determined, at least in the US, to make it one. We could turn away from that anytime now, anytime. Yeah. Um, I think this was a wonderful conversation um, that really, really targeted how deliberate decision making creates the conditions in which people live. And so I thank you so much for that. And I thank you for your time. And please tell us where we can find you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I am Carnethia. You can find me at MickeyKindle.com on Instagram as Carnethia. Basically, Carnethia, K-R-N-Y-T-H-I-A or Mickey Kindle will help you find me everywhere. All right. Well, thank you again so, so much. This was a wonderful conversation and I appreciate your insight and your time. And for everyone watching, uh, I hope y'all enjoyed it. I hope you're drinking water. Um, I hope you're wearing sunscreen. And I hope that you come back next week to see me talk with Jamel Bowie. All right, y'all. Take care. <laughs>